Thank you. Um, to this uh, crowd, I uh, don't have to uh, introduce the uh, framework, really the broad context for the work in my lab, which is uh, the notion that gene regulation is important. So I, I really will skip that. And I will start just by pointing out that uh, the debate about the relative importance of uh, gene regulatory differences versus changes to structural proteins as well as other mechanisms to speciation and adaptation is still ongoing as we all know. But at the same time, in the last two decades we have accumulated a large number of examples in a wide range of organisms where changes in gene regulation have been used as a key to explain recent adaptations and speciation events. While this is true in a large number of organisms, we have very few examples um, of such processes in humans and non-human primates, and that is obviously for, because of the uh, constraints, practical and ethical constraints on experimentations in humans and non-human apes. So really, um, this is uh, the point where it's getting very complicated trying to tie any molecular mechanism to actual adaptation. And it's quite unusual uh, if you think about it from a lab perspective, from, from the perspective of people who are used to work with lab animals. In primates, this is our entry point. We really start with, with gene expression uh, almost as, as, as a goal, not just as an intermediate phenotype because it's very difficult to push it there. And we have accumulated a large number of comparative gene expression data sets. Uh, and I think that the results of this large body of work actually uh, does motivate us. It does motivate us to look further uh, both at regulatory mechanisms and eventual phenotypes. And the result that I refer to is the fact that we see a lot of comparative patterns that are consistent with the action of natural selection. And while this is true in a lot of other organisms, it wasn't trivial uh, that we would be able to say it in primates for the following reason. So when we perform a comparative study in primates, and again, we cannot experiment on these animals, especially, of course, on humans, uh, we collect opportunistic samples. We collect samples post-mortem. We collect samples when animals uh, go under surgery, we collect samples, uh, quite frankly, when, when people die. We can't really control for the environment. We can't uh, control, we can't stage the tissues. Uh, we can't minimize any uh, uh, experimental noise. Uh, at, at best, we can control for things like sex and age, sometimes cause of death. Um, and so it's very much the case that usually the picture we see is a lot of variance in gene expression. So in this heuristic example, I I try to express the fact that not only across species, but also within individual, where every dot is an individual, you see a lot of variance in gene expression. And probably a lot of it is environmental. So it was actually quite surprising to us that we are also able to observe quite a lot of patterns that are consistent with a constraint on variation in gene expression levels, both within and between species. And that, of course, is consistent with the action of stabilizing selection. And conversely, we see a lot of examples where we have a lineage-specific shift in gene expression, either elevated or reduced, and the entire pattern is also consistent with uh, constraint on variation both within and between species, therefore differentiating this from simple relaxation of constraint in a particular lineage and uh, make it consistent with the scenario of directional selection. So we can't really perform experiments in the lab to prove that these instances uh, are in fact caused by selection or driven by selection, but when we uh, rank patterns by how uh, well they fit either this scenario or the other scenario, we can at least agree that we can reach for true uh, uh, events where regulation was under selection. So this motivates us and others to really push both into the realm of finding the actual uh, phenotypes, complex phenotypes that are under selection uh, and, and changing due to differences in gene regulation and uh, work such as uh, uh, studies such as the ones that are done in Gill's lab and, and uh, Jim Noonan's lab and Katie Pollard lab really go towards uh, that case and they can of course uh, share with you how hard it is to accumulate uh, each and every example like that. And what I want to tell you about today 
uh, our efforts to try and push it on the other direction and ask about the uh, upstream, if you will, events that generate the differences in gene expression that are being selected, namely uh, look at the regulatory mechanisms. And so the rationale is really to perform comparative studies of regulatory mechanisms and then look for correlations with the output, which is gene expression. And so we uh, started this a few years ago by looking at a couple of epigenetic mechanisms. Uh, one was DNA methylation at promoter regions, and the first observations we had was that you can clearly see b both differences in methylation across tissues as well as differences in methylation across species, and that recapitulates what other people have seen in, in human and mouse comparisons, but this time in much uh, closely related species, human and chimpanzee. And like in human and mouse, the separation based on methylation patterns across tissues is much more obvious than the separation based on uh, species, though it's pretty obvious as well here. And, and then we look at correlation between methylation and gene expression levels. And so here, still within species, we see a uh, high methylation level in the promoter of this gene in, in two tissues, liver and kidney, and, and low methylation level in the heart. And the gene expression uh, levels in these three tissues are inversely correlated with the methylation level in the promoter, as you might expect. And this is the same thing that we observe in chimpanzee. And in fact, we observe many more concordant patterns like that across species than expected by chance with a whoppingly significant p-value, indicating that this is a functional mechanism that is uh, probably under selection. But really what we want to uh, do here is ask about the connection between differences in the regulatory mechanism between species and the differences in the output. And here's the catch, the caveat, but also our, our, our rationale for how we perform this study. Uh, you all know this in this crowd, so I won't belabor the point too much. These are genomic studies that are completely based on correlation and partial correlations. They, they really tell you nothing about causality, nothing directly about, direct about causality. And so the, the entire talk, even if I won't mention it explicitly, it will all be based about these correlations. But for many of these regulatory mechanisms, and methylation is one of the best examples, which is the reason I start with it, there is an independent body of work, sometimes very large, that indicate that indeed this is a causative mechanism. Changes in methylation in the promoter do, in many cases, cause difference in output, namely gene expression level. And so based on this rationale and making this assumption, when we see a pattern like that across the species, namely high level of methylation in human and lower in chimpanzee, where the uh, uh, gene associated with this promoter shows the converse uh, expression pattern, we simply regress out the methylation level and ask whether we still see in the residual an evidence for expression difference between the species. And if we don't, we dare assume that this was causative, or at least we say we are able to propose uh, at least one explanation to account for this difference in gene expression. And we can do it for all the genes for which we have measurements, and in this plot, uh, all the uh, uh, black plot, black dots are data points where when you regress out methylations, you see consistent evidence for differences in gene expression between the species, whether consistently lack of evidence or consistently good evidence, and then the red points or the red data points are cases where once you regress methylation, there is no further evidence for differences in gene expression levels across the species. The blue points are really our, our control. This is what happens when you simply perturb the model. And so taking that into account, plus per mutations, to uh, specifically ask about our expectation under the null, we estimate that around 20% of gene expression differences in these different tissues can, are at least associated with corresponding differences in the uh, in methylation of the promoters at the expected direction. And so we propose one explanation for a portion of the expression differences. So back to, to, to the same story, a couple of years ago we still uh, considered regulatory mechanism one at a time and, and we progressed from talking about methylation to considering histone modification and our first example was uh, uh, this uh, histone modification that is associated with active genes uh, at the transcription start site. And so our examples or our rationale was, was very similar. You're looking at expression. This time uh, I'm just showing you the RNA sequencing tracks just to not to bore you with uh, figures that look exactly the same structure. And so this gene is highly expressed in human. There's really nothing in the chimpanzee. And, and the tracks of the chip sec for the histone modification 
really follow that quite nicely. And so once again, you can propose an explanation for the change in gene expression. Um, and you can look at it again in the entire genome, and once again with a slightly different structure of the plot, where here we rank genes from the ones that are higher expression in humans compared to chimpanzee all the way to genes that have the highest expression in chimpanzee compared to human. And on the y-axis, we plot for a sliding window of 500 genes, the proportion of genes that are associated in the TSS with that histone modification only in one species but not the other. And so for genes that are highly expressed in human, we see a high proportion of genes associated with the histone modification in human but not in chimpanzee, and this uh, pattern reverses for genes that are highly expressed in chimpanzee. So once again, uh, we can propose an explanation uh, for gene expression differences between the species based on histone modification at the TSS. But of course, these mechanisms do not work independently, uh, and there are a lot of interactions between them. And so at some point, uh, we figured we can't really get any more papers published just on single mechanisms, and we uh, began a study that uh, started collecting this, uh, on the same samples a very large number of uh, data sets. And this is still ongoing. And so what I'm giving you today is really a snapshot of our current uh, data set or combination of our current data sets, but there are more coming in the pipeline. Uh, uh, and I'll mention some in a, in a moment. So our, our samples are eight LCLs uh, or LCLs from eight different individuals across the three species, human, chimpanzee, and rhesus macaques. Um, and we have both males and females, although the uh, study is not uh, balanced with respect to sex. And we're collecting, of course, gene expression output using RNA sequencing, the chromatin accessibility and transcription factor binding footprint using DNA's one sig. A uh, couple of active gene marks, a couple of enhancer marks, a repressed region mark. And what I will not tell you about today, but I just want to give you the heads up, this is, this is the other data sets that we're, uh, most of them already collected but haven't analyzed. Uh, RNA decay, for SU, for, for direct measurements of transcription initiation rate, uh, proteomics on all these samples, um, and a couple other histone modifications, as well as uh, whole genome bisulfite uh, methylation. So um, the rate limiting step of these studies, as, as probably a lot of you know, are the quality control analysis, the low level analysis, the normalization, and I'm not going to tell you a lot about them. Uh, they're not very interesting to talk about, but they're very, very important. So I only want to share with you two real sanity checks just to increase uh, your confidence that uh, our data are uh, uh, good or, or at least make sense. And the first are just a heat map of, the, of pairwise correlations uh, within the data. Uh, and, and that heat map actually is consistent regardless of the data type uh, you're looking at. And what it shows is that um, any two individuals from the same species have a higher correlation than any two individuals across different species. And you'd expect that, of course, and it's gratifying to see that. But also that any human and chimp individuals have a higher correlation than any human or chimp individuals and rhesus macaque. And that, of course, uh, is consistent with the phylogenetic relationships across these three species. And also, uh, uh, let's just say, would be a problem if we saw any other pattern. The other quality control analysis uh, must be more familiar to you when you read the ENCODE papers and all other papers on large data set of the same kind. And this is just the enrichment of these types of histone modification, pole 2 uh, uh, signal uh, close to the transcription start site. So this is just aggregate plots on transcription start sites. Um, so this is familiar to you, and, and, and uh, we, of course, were happy to see that. But what's important for us was that this picture, and I'm just changing now the structure and showing these histograms as, as plots, um, uh, as continuous graphs. Uh, what's important for us is that it looks nearly identical across the three species. So the first indication for the very expected uh, result, but nevertheless uh, important to, to observe, that these mechanisms work in the same way across these three species, uh, even within the same range and, and, and within the same dynamic range. Um, when we start correlating these data sets with gene expression levels, first within the species, we see, as expected, that highly expressed genes are associated with the active marks and with the enhancers marks, and there's a depletion in highly expressed genes of the repressive mark. Um, 
And so the y-axis is, again, just the uh, proportion of enrichment in uh, 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 subsets of the gene, uh, a moving window of subsets of the genes, and genes are ranked from low expressed to highly expressed. And again, what's important is that these plots look nearly identical regardless of the species that you consider. And so that goes towards this dynamic range or the correlation uh, with the differences in dynamic range across the three species, suggesting that it's really working in, in nearly an identical manner. And so it brings us to the ability of asking, or, or to the point where we can ask about differences in this regulatory mechanism across species and correlate that with gene expression uh, levels. So there are a lot of differences, and this is just a table of, uh, with a certain FDR that you arbitrarily choose how many regions you classify based on the quantitative data as having are associated with differences in these system modifications or, or differentially expressed. And what you really want to do is, is correlate these data sets and ask whether we can explain some of the gene expression differences. And so we're doing it, or rather I chose to present it using these plots and I'll focus on just one of them to explain what you're seeing here. And so on the, this is a plot of, uh, co that considers a pairwise comparison, in this case a human and chimpanzee data set. And on the axis, as on this side, these are genes that are highly expressed in chimp, and on this side, the genes are highly expressed in human. And on the y-axis, we plot in marks enriched in chimpanzee, and all the way here, marks that are enriched in human. And it's exactly as you'd expect. The uh, enhancers mark are highly expressed in the species that has, are highly enriched in the species with the genes that are highly expressed, and the repressor marks show exactly the opposite direction. Uh, and again, this is true regardless of the pairwise comparisons you're, you are performing. So there's clear association between gene expression differences in these species and all these regulatory mechanisms that uh, we uh, documented. And the question is now how much of this variation in gene expression can we explain? And so I will now for the second but hopefully last time uh, uh, concede that we can't really say anything about causality and, and, and I, the reason I will say it again is because we are going into some of these two modifications here where, where causality even in independent experiments is not entirely clear so we don't really know here the, the chicken and the egg problem but nevertheless the, the, the question and the take home message here from this talk should be how many of gene expression differences are associated with other known differences in regulatory mechanisms and uh, we can do that independently using regression for each of the regulatory mechanisms, but of course the point of this study is to try to start combining them and acknowledge the fact that they don't work independently and that they collaborate. And so we can either use all marks in the model or a variable selection approach. And the bottom line is that we can explain roughly 45% of the variation in gene expression just by taking into account histone modifications um, alone. So what about the rest? Well, I told you about other data sets that we're collecting. Uh, some uh, of the variation must be explained in, with decay processes, and of course there's a the methylation to include. But one of the things that we were excited to start considering are differences in transcription factor binding sites, where we also think that the inference of causality is, is much stronger. And people have introduced DNA uh, sequencing data quite a lot uh, in this conference, especially in the last two hours. So I'm not going to talk too much about the structure of the data except to say that we are using the property of the data that allows us to look for footprints of transcription factor binding uh, when you recognize the uh, motif of uh, a particular transcription factor. So if you know the PWM, you can ask about footprints. And the footprints are not just very uh, uh, qualitatively obvious, they're also somewhat quantitative. And so this is a plot from the 2010 paper by Roger, who's sitting in the crowd, uh, who introduced this methodology. This paper appeared along with, back to back with a paper from a Greg Crawford uh, group that also uh, uh, optimized the methodology to do the same thing. And actually, I saw a poster reporting that uh, uh, in this meeting. And what it shows you here is that there's a cor nice correspondence between the uh, strength of the evidence from the uh, DNA's footprint and the chipsec and the evidence from chipsec for the same transcription factor. Uh, which means that this data is, uh, at least to some extent, quantitative. So we can do that, or rather we have done this, they have done, mapped the footprints uh, in three species, in all these samples, and quite intuitively what we can do now is, is start asking about differences in cis and trans regulatory elements. So these are aggregate plots of a transcription factor that shares all, more than 80% of the sites across the three species, uh, where 
without even looking, I'll, I'll, I'll infer that the relatively few differences in binding site are probably due to differences in cis in the binding site itself. And here is an example where the aggregate plot uh, across the three species are shown for a transcription factor where 80% of the sites are actually different between species. And so I would, I would guess that this is actually supporting a difference in trans, namely in the transcription factor itself, whereby if we are able to track down all the sites in the, say, resource macaque, we'll probably recover a different PWM altogether for this transcription factor, which doesn't necessarily mean that it doesn't bind a very similar uh, uh, battery of genes. It just probably doesn't bind at exactly the same uh, site. So overall, we can look at the distribution of uh, transcription factors that share uh, binding sites in only one, two, or three species, and you can see that there's quite a wide distribution, and mainly focus on, on uh, this part of the plot where uh, binding is shared in all three species. There are a lot of transcription factors that share close to 80 or above 80, and then there are a lot of transcription factors that share very few sites, 20, 20, 30 percent of their site, where there's some evidence for trans. And so we uh, proceed by asking specifically on each instance whether we can see a difference in the binding site or not. So here's an example where this is the footprint. I'm, I'm just showing it now on a slightly larger scale. So, so if, you know, if, you, if, you were, if you were looking at things like that, now these two peaks are here and here, and this is the binding site. And what you can see here is that there's a difference in uh, human uh, change from C to T, and that T is completely out of the PWM, completely out of the consensus for this binding site. From a statistical point, it abolishes the binding site. And when you consider the DNA's data, indeed, there's just no footprint in human, where that, by there's quite obvious footprints in uh, chimpanzee and rhesus, and that's the estimate of the posterior of that uh, binding site based on the uh, DNA's data, so uh, in applying the centipede algorithm that uh, Roger has developed. So, this we can do for every single binding site where we observe either a difference or a consistent binding. And overall, we can ask whether for all these instances where we infer in cis, just across all the three genomes, do we see evidence, do we see true evidence for a change in the binding site um, rather than an inexplicable uh, differences in binding that is not supported by sequence. And so I'm showing it in a structure like that where in the first plot I'll show sites that are bound in both species, uh, in this case human and chimpanzee. And what I'll show in this plot are the distribution of sites that, based on the sequence, are deemed s stronger binding sites or weaker binding sites in each species when compared to the known PWM. And reassuringly, when the uh, transcription factor is inferred to bind in both species, we don't see really a bias towards sites that are stronger in human or chimpanzee. So it, it, it seems like pretty much a lot of the sites are identical, and when there are differences, uh, they're kind of random. But when we infer binding primarily in human or primarily in chimpanzee, we start seeing a difference that is in the expected direction. So these binding sites are stronger in human when the transcription factor is bound in human and, and the other way in chimpanzee. And this pattern is even more pronounced for the differences in binding between and corresponding differences in the binding sites between human and rhesus. And I'm not showing you the chimpanzee and rhesus comparison, but it's exactly the same. So we, we have strong evidence that we can recapitulate differences in cis and understand their implication on transcription factor binding using the uh, DNA's data, using the footprints. I don't have a lot of data to show you uh, for the trans analysis. This is still uh, ongoing. Uh, but, but I will briefly say that we do see for those transcription factors that uh, are inferred to uh, change in trans, or so the transcription factor itself change, evidence that the, the, there are a lot of differences corresponding, probably corresponding, we haven't connected the dots there yet, probably corresponding differences in motifs across species. So here I'm showing you just a plot of the distribution of eight mirror words across the three species. Obviously most of the motifs are shared, between all three species, and, and, and sometimes between just the two species, but there are a small proportion of motifs that are species-specific, and those, I believe, that when we finish connecting the dots, will connect to exactly those transcription factors that we infer to have changed in trends. So we have that data, and it looks good. We just need a couple more days. Um, of course, what we do with all this now is bringing it 
bringing it to, back to the expression and ask about the correlation between the gene expression and changes in transcription factor binding. And here's just one example, and of course I'm going to generalize it in, a, in the next slide, where uh, a loss of E2F site in the rhesus macaque uh, resulted in a loss of uh, footprint, so we infer that there's no binding of E2F in this promoter, and indeed this is, correlates pretty well with uh, uh, lineage-specific reduction of expression in rhesus. So how often does it happen? Well, there is a general correlation between uh, uh, sensitivity at footprints and gene expression level, so this is a human chimp comparison, RNA effect size and DNA effect size. The correlation is very weak, however, and the reason for that is that a lot of changes in uh, in, in, in footprints do not really result in change or are not associated with change in gene expression levels. But in contra and, and that probably makes sense, that they can happen uh, in enhancers that affect pretty much anything, uh, and we're looking at one cell type at one particular time. But in that cell type, in that particular time, nearly all the differences in gene expression levels are associated with at least one difference in uh, transcription factor binding. So we're putting it all together, along with the histone modifications, and this is not a snapshot of, of, of where we are, we think that we can explain around 65% of the variation, which, um, uh, again, I think that it's not a complete picture, doesn't say much about causality, but I think it's a step in the right direction in, in understanding these uh, differences in regulation, how they connect to the output, and we'll deliver all that to Gil to test all of these in his mice and zebrafish. So let me just finish uh, by uh, acknowledging a lot of the people in uh, my lab uh, that have done this work, primarily uh, uh, Atma, who is uh, actually no longer in, uh, in my lab. She's now a postdoc. This is still a picture of, of her as a graduate student. She's now a postdoc in Boston. And then Roger, who developed the uh, centipede model and also helped us analyze the uh, DNA's data. Uh, Greg, who has been instrumental in, in uh, moving the technology into my lab. And I always... Uh, like to remember to uh, acknowledge Yerkes and the other primate centers without which we never have access to all these samples. And if we have time, I'm happy to answer questions. Okay, questions for you all? Yeah, please. Thanks, that's uh, fantastic. I love it when people look at human primate differences from a meaningful citizen trans perspective. I have two questions. Uh, so the STAT5A data, you know, with that flabbergasting 80% of allegedly human specific binding events, you know, potentially that's a very important result. Uh, have you done uh, some basic analysis of the putative gene targets, you know, the nearest genes, are they coding, microRNA, non-coding, is there any sense to doing ontologies of them, are there any, you know, human encephalization or energy related brain genes enriched in the ontologies? Thank you for this question, it, it's an important question and it gives me the opportunity to say that uh, this, is, this is a statistical analysis of correlation and it's based on indirect data of footprints, which is the DNAs, which I trust and I, and I think it's very insightful, but with every target of interest, we are now performing reciprocal chips in these cell lines where we uh, transfect uh, a, tagged, uh, a tagged version of the transcription factor, both the human and the chimp, to each of the cell lines. And we want to actually observe it in the lab that there's actually a trans effect there, at which point we'll begin the analysis that you described. Uh, great, thanks. The, the other question, just a quick question. So that uh, three-way Venn diagram of the eighth mirror motifs, if you remember, for human chimp and rhesus, um, is this basically the, what you expect, say, for, you know, any species that, uh, that have this particular evolutionary footprint? In other words, if you did this for, say, you know, mouse and rat, you know, what would it look like? Uh, is this basically what you expect? I think that's a very good question, and I don't know what the answer to that. I can tell you that in Drosophila you see very different things. Uh, I, 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 so, so I guess my current intuition is that in mammals, yes, you probably see the same thing. But in Drosophila species, it seems that, that the, the, the ratio of cis and trans and how this, and how this evolution works is, is, is tilted in a slightly different way. I don't have an explanation for that. And, and my intuition is, is, is partially because of this observation, but I don't know what the relevance of that or Right, because here, for example, you see that 6% the, that outlying age in, in human, you know, that's sort of half of the non-overlaps of the chimp and rhesus, but whether that's within, you know, the, the p-value on that wouldn't be significant, what kind of tests to run to figure out whether that overhang is different or not. 
Right, I don't think that it was significant, but also you, you need to, the, the operation or the important point here is that these are eight mayor wards right now and, and they sh really should be recapitulated to PWMs and all these numbers will decrease substantially uh, and will become uh, hopefully clear. Um, but, but yeah, I don't think that these numbers are particularly significant. Okay, if there are no more questions to you have, let's thank you.